Hi everyone, this is a video that's going to take you through the work solutions we've put together for the re most recent assessment that you did in October. And the purpose of the video and the work solutions is to help you with questions that you either struggled with or where you made a mistake. And it's really important that you use this video and the work solutions in the best possible way. The easiest thing for you to do would be just to look at the video and look at the work solutions and just literally copy from one booklet to the other. Honestly, that is pointless. That is just an absolute waste of time. Don't do it. Because when you copy, you're not really thinking about it. It's just a mindless activity and you don't remember what it is you've done. You're not understanding. What you lack is not the answers, it's the understanding of how to get the answers. So the best way to do this is to watch the video come to a question that you can't do go to that part of the video that covers that question and without writing anything just listen to the video and watch what happens and just focus on trying to understand don't take any notes once that part of the video is finished stop it and see if you can then do the question from memory that will make you think about what you're doing and you'll remember it much more please do that so the golden rule is that you should never be watching the video and writing at the same time. Only do one of those two things. Watch the video or write, but never both. Okay, let's go on to the questions and see how we get on. So the first few set of questions, I'm hoping that you should do really easy and no problem at all. So 180 minutes, 60 minutes in an hour, so 180 is three hours. Three lots of 60 is 180. 0.73 as a percentage, well 0.73 means 73 out of 100, which is literally 73%. Make sure you write it as a percent, don't write 73 over 100. It's correct, 0.73 is 73 out of 100, but that's a fraction, not a percentage. Make sure you write it and don't lose this mark. When you do this question here, remember to do the bracket first of all. So anything in a bracket must get done first of all. So three plus five is eight, and then 10 times eight is 80. A prime number that's between 20 and 30. Now a prime number is a number that's only got two factors. You can only write it as one times 11 if you're using whole numbers. There's nothing else, no other way of making 11 apart from one times 11. Likewise with 13, one times 13 only with 17, 1 times 17 is the only way. So these are examples of prime numbers. And the question asks us to find a prime number that's between 20 and 30. And the answers you're looking for are either 23 or 29. 27 isn't, because you can make it with 1 times 27, but you can also make it with 3 times 9. That means it's not a prime number. Likewise, 25 is an odd number, but it's not prime because you can make it with 1 times 25 and of course you can also make it with 5 times 5. So the numbers you're looking for is one of these two. Either will do, you don't need both. Question 5 asks you to find a number that's exactly halfway between 7 and 15. Probably the most straightforward way is to write out the numbers literally from 7 to 15 and just count in. You've got 4 numbers this side, 4 numbers this side, 11 is plainly in the middle. If they asked you something a little bit more complicated, say they asked you 7.5 and 15, that's a bit more complicated. And one way that always works, especially if you're allowed to use a calculator, is just to simply find the average of the two numbers. So halfway between 7 and 15, just find the average of those two numbers. Add them together, that's 22, and divide by 2 because you've got two numbers, you get 11. And that's a method you could use if these numbers were a bit more horrible, say they were decimals or say they were negatives. Question 6 is a fairly straightforward question, but people made a muck up here with the £50 for each day. What they missed out is that the hotel is £50 for each day, but these are the total amount you would pay in a week. So it's only this amount that you multiply by 7. So the teacher here has said, OK, there's four people, so 150 lots of, or four lots of 150 is 600 quid for the travel. 50 pounds times four is 200 pounds per person. Multiply that by seven because it's seven days in the week, gives you 1400 pounds in total. And 250 times four per person is 1000. Add it together, you get 3000. Or you could just do it the other way around and say, okay, one person 
well they would have 150 pounds for travel 50 pounds for each day that's 50 times 7 350 pounds hotel plus 250 pounds spending money add it up you get 750 and that's the total cost for one person and now multiply it by 4 to get 3000 so 750 double it is 1500 double that again 3000 so either way you do it you should get the same answer question 7 nice and simple as long as you don't make any silly mistakes so in Adam's garden the flowers are only red or white or yellow or blue chart shows the number of red flowers the number of white flowers and the number of yellow flowers the total number of flowers is 30 work out the number of blue flowers so you simply add up the 8 the 10 and the 5 that you've got for the number of red white and yellow flowers that comes to 23 and then you subtract 23 away from 30 because what's left is the blue and that gives you 7 and amazingly you get 2 marks for that so it's really important that you don't throw marks away and you make sure you get that 2 marks for getting 7 now the mode is the most popular or common thing it's the thing that happens the most so you just simply look at the bar chart and look at which bar is tallest it's white okay we just worked out what the blue ones are that's seven that's not as high so the tallest bar is white now it's really important that you write down that the mode is white some people put down 10 that's not the mode that's the reason why white is the mode it has the highest frequency 10 there were 10 white flowers there were five yellow flowers but white is the most popular color and that's the most important thing so white goes here question 8 start or write the following fractions in order of size start with the smallest fraction now it's important first of all that you are able to compare fractions that have one in the numerator a quarter is less than a third and a third is less than a half the bigger this denominator is the more pieces you are cutting it into and so the smaller each person's piece is going to be would you rather have an ice cream block cut into three with you having a piece or cut into four well I suppose it depends whether you like ice cream but if you do like ice cream you'd probably prefer to have a third of it rather than a quarter and even better a half then we've got 7 out of 12. Where does that fit? Well, 7 out of 12 is more than a half because 6 out of 12 would be a half. So we know that 7 out of 12 is more than a half. Where are we going to put 3 quarters? Well, 3 quarters is 9 out of 12. 3 quarters of 12 is 9. So 9 out of 12 is 3 quarters. So this is the same thing as 9 out of 12, which is bigger than the 7 out of 12. So this is the fractions all in order. Another way to do it is to simply change all these fractions that have different denominators into denominators of 12. So multiply top and bottom here by 4, top and bottom here by 3 to make 4 into 3. Once again, do that by 3, do that by, we don't need to do anything because it's already got a 12, and multiply top and bottom here by 6, and you get these fractions. So this is the same as that, this is the same as that, we use the word equivalent, this fraction is equivalent to that and now they've all got 12 on the bottom it's easy to see which is the biggest and the smallest by just comparing the numerators that's why we make the denominators the same question 9 Ruth left her home at 9 a.m. and walked to the library she got to the library at 10:30. Ruth walked at a speed of 4 miles per hour work out the distance Ruth walked well She's walked a total distance of one and a half hours. Now she walks at four miles per hour. That means that she would do, well, she would do four miles in every hour. That's what four miles per hour means. And so in half an hour, she'd do half that distance, which would be two. So in total, in one and a half hours, she would walk a total of four plus two, six miles. Ruth got to the library at 10.30 and she stayed at the library for 50 minutes then she walked home Ruth took one and a quarter hours to walk home at what time did Ruth get home okay so add on 50 minutes to 10.30 makes 11.20 
if you're not sure that what I do in my head is I add on an hour and then take off 10 okay because 50 minutes is 10 less than an hour that's the way I do it in my head different people have got different ways so she left at 1120 and now we have to add on one hour 15 onto that which takes us to 1235 Question 10, solve t plus t plus t is 12. Well, three t's are 12, so each of these t's must be worth four. Then x minus two is six, so it's really important you don't take the six away, the two away from the six. That's a common mistake. Just simply add two to both sides and you get x is eight. If you think about it, that makes sense because eight take away two is six. Solve six w plus two is 20. We'll take two from both sides and you get six W is 18. And if six W's are 18, share by six and you get W is three. A quick check, six times three is 18, plus two is 20, so W must be three. Question 11 is really, really important that you have got a way of multiplying these two numbers together without using a calculator. Now the teacher has shown you this long multiplication method. That's the method that I would do, use if I was doing the multiplication, but other people have got different ways of doing it. And it's important that you have a way, any way, as long as you don't use a calculator. Now, you can find out how to multiply two two-digit numbers easily. You can type it into YouTube. You could go into Hegarty Maths. You could go to Corbett Maths. You could ask your teacher. There's loads of different ways of, of doing it and loads of different ways of finding out. If you don't know how to do this, well, that will be a surprise because I know that it's been on your homework for the last three weeks where you had to multiply two two-digit numbers together. So you should have sorted that problem out by now. It would be a shame if you got this question wrong because you hadn't sorted it out in the homework. You could do it this way, as I say, which is the way that I would prefer, or you can cut that into a box. I think it's called the chunking method. So 74 is 70 and 4, 58 is 50 and 8, and you could put the 50 and the 8 there and the 70 and the 4 there if you wanted to. And now to work out what goes in each side, in each box rather, you just go above and to the side. So 70 and 50, 7 times 5 is 35, add on the noughts. 4 times 50, 200. 8 times 70 is uh, 560, 56 add the noughts. Um, and 8 times 4 is 32. And then you just simply add the numbers that are in this box and you get 4292. Another way, which is quite slick, is very similar to this way, but you put in 74 and 58 like this and you draw diagonal lines and then in each box you go 4 times 5 20 in here 7 times 5 35 in here 7 times 8 is 56 and in here 3 4 times 8 32 and then you add diagonally so 2 goes there 3 and 6 is 9 2 and 5 and 5 is 12 2 down carry that one, one and that three makes four. So all three ways get the same answer, of course, and you just need a way that does this. If you don't know how to do it, find out, even if it means asking your teacher, but don't throw away two marks. That's crazy. Question 12, AB and BC are perpendicular lines. What does perpendicular mean? It means they're at right angles. So that means that even though there's no right angle sign here, they are at right angles because it says they're perpendicular. So that must mean that these three angles add up to make 90, add up what you've got, 25 and 25, that makes 50, take the 50 away from 90, you've got 40. RS and TU are parallel lines, you can see that because you've got the arrows on these lines, and PQ is a straight line. An angle of 125 is shown on the diagram. Write down the letter of one other angle of size 125. Give a reason for your answer. Well, it, the teacher here has written down two possible answers. You only need one. Probably the most straightforward and simple and easier way is to take B because it's opposite. So B because it's vertically opposite. You could also have D, which is this one here. Now, that angle and that angle 
are called corresponding angles and when we're doing this in class we often call these F angles and that's because you've got a, like an F a slanting F here okay I hope you can see that now when you're looking for angles that are the same you're looking for F's but you mustn't use it and you mustn't call it an F angle you must remember that it's a corresponding angle and probably the best way I think of remembering it is Mrs. Deacon's uh, way which is that F stands for fish and a fish lives in a pond and it's a corresponding angle so when you're looking for an F it stands for fish that lives in a pond it's a corresponding angle uh, you might have also heard of Z angles you see a Z here okay even though it doesn't ask us this angle here and this angle here that's not labeled are the same because they make a Z and in that case you would use the word alternate and the way I remember that is because Z stands for zebra and a zebra's got an alternating black and white stripes so onto this one here explain why A plus B plus C is 235 so A plus B plus C must be 235 because it has to add with the 125 to make a complete turn of 360. So you can see that the teacher here has written it out quite formally. It's just simply saying A plus B plus C is 235 because 235 plus 125 is 360 and all these angles are meeting at a point. That's the point, angles around a point. Question 13 is a question that lots of people got wrong. It says the length of a line is x centimetres. Write down an expression in terms of x for the length of the line in millimetres. Now, if you're not sure about that, just put some numbers in instead. If it was 1 centimetre, what would it be in millimetres? 10 millimetres. If it was 3 centimetres, what would it be in millimetres? 30 millimetres. If it was 7 centimetres, it would be 70 millimetres and now ask yourself what am I doing to the centimetre number to turn it into the millimetre number and you're just simply multiplying by 10 so whatever that x number is in number of centimetres you would multiply it by 10 to get how many millimetres you've got so if you've got x centimetres you've got 10x millimetres work out one fifth of 70 well, first of all, there's two things to do. Number one, what do you do? Well, one fifth means you divide it by five. Okay. Like one half means divide it into two. So one fifth means divide it by five. And the second stage is can you divide something by five? So you could do it this way, get 14. And an easier way to do it in your head is if you're going to divide it by five, well, five is half of 10. So divide 70 by 10, first of all, because that's easy. That's seven. And because 5 is half of 10, it's going to go in twice as many times. So 70 divided by 10 is 7. So 70 divided by 5 is 14. Fiona has to work out the exact value of 48 divided by a half. And she writes 48 divided by a half is 24. That's what a load of people do. Real common error. Fiona's reason is there are two halves in 1. So there will be 24 halves in 48 explain what is wrong with Fiona's reason. Well, if you think about it, this part here is actually correct. There are two halves in one. And can you see that this number is twice as big as this number? So in that case, this number should be twice as big as this, not half of it. If there's two halves in one, there'd be four halves in two, six halves in three, and basically 96 halves in 48. You're basically saying how many halves make 48? How many half pizzas would you need to make 48 whole ones? You'd need 96. Another way is simply that you know when you're dividing by a fraction, you take that dividing fraction, you flip it upside down so it becomes 2 over 1, and you multiply. So 48 divided by a half gives the same answer as 48 multiplied by 2 over 1, which is essentially just 2. So 48 times 2 is 96. The square root of 64 is 8 because 8 times 8 makes 64. And when you cube 53, 
I beg your pardon, when you cube five, you're multiplying it by itself three times. So five times five times five, 125. Question 16 says expand 2n minus 3 times 5. So everything inside this bracket gets multiplied by 5. 5 times 2m is 10m. Take away 5 lots of 3, which is 15. Now you're going to factorize this. So you're looking to see what factors they share. Well, there's a bit, an algebra bit here, but there's no letter there. So there's no letters that they share. The only thing that they share is that's in the 3 times table and that's in the 3 times table. So the 3 goes outside. Then you want an n here so that 3 times n makes 3n and a 4 here so that 3 times 4 makes 12. So this process is the opposite of this process. Here we started off with brackets and we got something without brackets. Here we've got something without brackets and we want to put it into brackets. Question 17. Stuart throws a biased coin 10 times. He gets 7 tiles. Maxine throws the same coin, that's important, 50 times. She gets 30 tiles. Prussia is going to throw the coin once. Whose results will give the better estimate for the probability that she will get tiles? Stuart's or Maxine's? You must give a reason for your answer. Now Stuart got 7 out of 10 and Maxine got 30 out of 50. And the answer is Maxine. Her results are the most reliable because she has done the most trials. She did the experiment the most number of times. The more times you do in a, an experiment or a survey, the more people you ask, the more reliable are your results. Okay? So use Stuart's Maxine and Maxine's results to work out an estimate for the probability that pressure will get tails. Well, we just agreed here that Maxine's results are the best because she did the experiment the most number of times. So if you combine these experiment results together, you'll get even more results, and so the results will be more reliable. So in total, Stuart threw the coin 10 times, and Maxine threw it 50, so that's a total of 60. And then Stuart got 7, and Maxine got 30, and that makes 37. So it's 37 out of 60. Just be careful that we're not adding these two fractions together. If we were asked to add 7 tenths and 30 out of 50, we would not be able to do what we've just done here. We're not adding these two fractions together. We're combining the results. 10 throws by Stuart, 50 by Maxine makes a total of 60. 7 uh, tails from Stuart, 30 tails from Maxine makes a total of 37. So that's your... Uh, answer for the probability. You don't need to turn it into a percentage or a decimal or anything like that. Leave it like that. Now, just going back to that first part of that question, it says whose results will give the better estimate for the probability that she will get tails? And a lot of people chose this number here because it's the biggest number. 7 out of 10 is a bigger fraction than 30 out of 50. But it didn't ask that. It's not asking whose results show the highest probability. It's not asking for the biggest fraction. If it was, it would be Stuart. It's asking who has the most reliable, trustworthy results. It's a biased coin. We know it's not going to be a 50-50. But the question is, how do we find out what the probability is? By doing an experiment. Maxine did the experiment more times than Stuart, so her results are more reliable. The fact that the probability is lower here than it is here is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Okay. Let's move on to question 18. So question 18 says the diagram shows a rectangular garden path, 600 centimeters by 120 centimeters. And Wasim is going to cover the path with paving stones. Each paving stone is a square of side 30. Each paving stone costs two pound 50. Wasim has 220 pounds to spend on paving stones show that he has enough money to buy all the paving stones he needs. Now what some people did is they took this 120 and the 600 and they multiplied it to get 72,000 and then what they did is they divided it by 30. Now multiplying these two numbers together to get 72,000 is one way of doing the question but 
that's the area of this rectangle. To make it right, what you would need to do then is rather than divide by 30, which is a length, you need to divide by the area of this square, which would be 30 times 30, which is 900. So you would need to divide 72,000 by 900. For me, an easier way to do it is to actually picture filling this rectangle up with these paving stones. Now, a paving stone is 30 centimeters and it's 600 along here. So the question is, how many 30s would you need in a row to make 600? And the answer would be 20. 20 times 30 is 600. So 20 tiles would fit here. You'd have a row of 20. Now, how many rows of 20 would there be? Well, this is 120. How many 30s make 120? Answer, four. So four rows of 20 would fit inside this rectangle. You'd have 20 from here to here, and four rows of 20, because four lots of 30 makes 120. So how many tiles would you need altogether? It would be 20 times four, which is 80 paving stones needed. 80 times two pound 50 is 200. And then you need to say, Wasim needs 200 pounds, and he's got 220, so he's got enough money. And that's important. If you did all this calculation and got 200 and then said nothing, you've lost the mark. You've got to say, Wasim needs 200 pounds, he's got 220 pounds, he's got enough money. Okay? Question 9. You make the denominators the same, and then subtract the numerators. So we can't do any subtraction yet because we've got we're not taking away like from like that's thirds and that's fifths multiply numerator and denominator top and bottom by 5 to get 10 out of 15 that's the same fraction and an equivalent fraction to 2 thirds multiply here by 3 to get 3 out of 15 if you were going to add now it would simply be 10 plus 3 13 out of 15 but it's actually subtraction so, same idea, but now you subtract the numerators to get 7 out of 15. When you're working out this, okay, multiplying fractions is actually easier than adding fractions, I think so. And a simple way to do it is just simply 2 times 3, which is 6, and 3 times 4, which is 12, and 6 out of 12 is a half. So you make sure you write it in its simplest form. If you wrote 6 over 12 and left it, that's a one mark answer. You can see here that the teacher has done the cancelling first. Think about what we did here. We did the multiplication and then we cancelled it down to a half. An old school way of doing it, the way I like to do it, is to cancel it down first of all. So divide that by two and divide that by two. So that's one now and that's two. Divide that by three and that by three. So that's one and one. So your answer would be one times one, which is one, and one times two, which is a half. If you're not sure about that, don't worry, just do it this way, it'll be fine. What's important is you get the right answer and you show it in its simplest form. Question 20, here are two squares, A and B. The length of the side square A is 50% of the length of the side of square B. Express the area of the shaded region of square A as a percentage of the area of square B. Now, I am someone who likes a diagram. You can see here that the teachers use some algebra, and that's fine, but you could just do it with a diagram. So some people, and I'm one of them, like a diagram. So basically what we're saying here, the length of the square A is 50% of the length of the side square B. Or another way of saying it is that is twice as much as what that is. So that means we could fit in two by two, four of these squares here would fit in this diagram. And I think when you look at it, you can see it more clearly. So doing a diagram really helps. So you can see that each of these squares is 25% of B. You need four of them, so each one is a quarter, so it's 25%. So A is 25% of the whole square. And the triangle is half of that square, so it's half of 25%, so it's 12.5%. Question 21, there are 40 students in a class. Each student walks to school or cycles to school or gets the bus to school. There are 22 girls in the class. Nine of the girls walk to school, 
Seven of the boys cycle to school. Six of the ten students who get the bus to school are boys. Find the number of these students who walk to school. Now, the way that I would recommend doing it, and the way that the teacher's done it below, is to put it in what's called a two-way table. And what that means is the data you've got is split in two ways. One way, it's split by gender, boys and girls, and the other way is it's split by the way they get to school. So what you want to do is draw a table up like this that splits the data by gender and then total, and then the way they go to school. And this helps to present the information so you can see what it is you've got to do. So let's have a quick look. You've got 22 girls, or 40 students in the class, so there's 40. I'm just going to make the magnification a little bit smaller so we can see both these things at the same time. Okay, so you've got 40 students in class, so there's your total. It says there are 22 girls in the class. So immediately you know that there will be 18 boys. It says 9 of the girls walk to school, so 9 girls walking to school. 7 of the boys cycle to school. 7 boys cycle to school. 6 of the 10 students who get the bus are boys. So 10 boys get the bus, okay, and 6 of them, big pardon, 10 people get the bus, and 6 of them are boys. Once you put this information into a table, it's easy to work out what the missing numbers are going to be and how you're going to do it. Trust me, it is so easy. The most difficult thing of this whole question is actually realizing that you've got to put it into a table. And when you do, you're working out the numbers really easily and you've got four lovely simple marks. Okay, let's just make that bigger again. So, question 22. There are only blue cubes, red cubes, and yellow cubes in a box. The probability shows that, beg your pardon, the table shows the probability of taking at random a blue cube from this box is 0.2. The number of red cubes is the same as the number of yellow cubes in the box. Complete the table. Well, if that's 0.2, what's left must be 0.8 because they've got to add up to make 1. And if they're both the same, they must both be 0.4. There are 12 blue cubes in the box. Work out the total number of cubes in the box. Well, if that's the probability of getting it, 0.2, and that's 12, this is twice as likely, so there must be twice as many in the box. So if there's 12 blue, there must be 24 red, and for the same reason, 24 yellow. So in the box are 24 yellow, 24 red, and 12 blue, and that makes a total of 60. Question 23. Dion needs 50 grams of sugar to make 15 biscuits, and she also needs three times as much flour as sugar, and two times as much butter as sugar. Dion is going to make 60 biscuits, work out the amount of flour she needs. Well, first of all, let's just work out how much flour and sugar she needs for 15. She needs 50 grams of sugar to make 15 biscuits, three times as much flour as sugar, so three lots of that is 150, and 100 grams of butter, because two lots of 50 is 100. So that's how many much flour and butter and sugar you would need for 15. And now all you need to do is simply multiply this by 4, or double it and double it again, because you want 60 biscuits. So the amount of flour she needs, well, you need 150 for 15, so you'd need 300 for 30, and you'd need 600 for uh, 60 biscuits. So there we go, 600 grams. Dion has to buy all the butter she needs to make 60 biscuits. She buys the butter in 250 gram packs, how many packs of butter does Dion need to buy? Well, she needs four lots of 100, because that's what you need for 15 biscuits, but she wants to make 60, four times as much, so she'll need 400 grams. Uh, so obviously, pack comes in 250, one pack's not gonna be enough, and two packs gives you 500, so she'll have to buy two packs. She's not gonna need it all, she'll have 100 grams left over, but you can't buy it part of a pack, so she'll need to buy two. Question 24, find the highest common factor of 72 and 90. Now it's really important that you understand what the highest common factor is because it helps you understand. 
So every number has factors and some numbers have factors in common and the highest one is called the highest common factor. Basically when we see a question like this what we're saying is tell me the biggest number or find the biggest number that goes exactly into 72 and also goes exactly into 90. So 10 goes into 90 but it doesn't go into 72. 8 goes into 72 but it doesn't go into 90. It's got to be a number that goes into both. Now, one way to do it is to write out all the factors of the number. And what I recommend you do, if you do that, I'd recommend you actually did it this way for small numbers. But be systematic so you don't miss anything. So 72 is 1 times 72. So 1 and 72 are factors. Okay, you've done 1. 2 times 36. 3 times 24. 4 times 18. 6 times 12. 8 times 9. That's a really good idea to be good and systematic there so you don't miss out any numbers. In the same way, 90 is 1 times 90. 2 times 45. 3 times 30. 5 times 18. 6 times 15 and 9 times 10. And the biggest number, you can see that 9's in both lists, and that's what actually some people put down. You can see that 1's in both lists, and so's 2, and so's 3. But the biggest number that's in both lists is 18. Now, if you put down 9, or you put down, uh, what's the other one, 6, you get one mark. All right? But 18 is the biggest number. Another way of doing it that's a lot of hard work and I'd recommend doing it for when these numbers are bigger is to break the number down into its prime factors so 90 is 2 times 45 45 is 5 times 9 and 9 is 3 times 3 and then 72 is 2 times 36 36 is 2 times 18 18 is 2 times 9 and 9 is 3 times 3 so 72 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 and 90 is 2 times 3 times 3 times 5 and the things that they both got in common, they both got a 3, they both got a second 3. And they both got a 2. Have they got anything else? There's a 5 here, but there's not a 5 here. There's a second and a third 2 here, but they're not here. So what have they got in common? Two 3s and a 2. 3, 3 and 2. And multiplying those two 3 numbers together, 3 times 3 times 2 is 18. Now, Speaking personally, this is a lot of hard work to get something that's fairly simple. I would do it this way only if, first of all, the numbers were big, because finding all the factors would take a long time, or if the question specifically asked me to do this, what's called prime factorization. If it's just numbers that are just fairly like times table type numbers, I would do it this way. But I really, 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 really really recommend that you are organized with what you're doing okay so you get all the factors and you don't miss any out question 25 the diagram shows the plan front elevation and side elevation of a solid shape drawn on a centimeter grid in the space below draw a sketch of the solid shape give the dimensions of the solid on your sketch so this is essentially a Pritt stick when you look down on it, that's what a plan is, the view you get when you look down, you would see a circle. When you look to the side and look to the front, so here's to the front and here's to the side, you would see a rectangle. If you don't believe me, get a print stick and look at it. So this is called the front elevation, just basically means front view, side view and plan view, which is looking down. So it's a cylinder. Lots of people got this answer and they got a mark for it. They lost the mark because it says, give the dimensions of the solid on your sketch. And you've got to write down, height is five. Actually, draw a line in there. Height is five. How do I know it's five? Because it's one, two, three, four, five. And the radius is two. How do I know that? Because the radius goes from the center to the rim. And it's two squares. So the radius is two. Question 26 says, shape A can be transformed to shape B by a reflection in the x-axis followed by a translation. Find the value of C and the value of D. So, first of all, what is a translation? A translation is just a slide where you don't flip it or you don't rotate it. 
it's just a slide. So we've got three marks for doing this. So first of all, a reflection in the x-axis. Here's the x-axis, I've coloured it in green. So we're going to make that a mirror and we're going to reflect this shape in the mirror. So you could do it with tracing paper or you could say this base of this triangle is two squares above the mirror so the reflection will be two squares below the mirror. This is one, two, three, so that will be one, two, three, and you can see that this is a reflection. If you do that, already you've got some marks. Then we're going to translate it. You can see how we're going to do it. We're going to slide this green reflected triangle to where B is. And we've got to describe that transformation or that translation. So when we're doing a translation, we literally just count how many squares left or right we do left is negative and right is positive and how many squares up and down up is positive and down is negative so for moving from that point there to that point there we move along one two three four five six to the left and one down so it's minus six and minus one and we write it down here it's really important when you do this that you count as you move one two three four Five, six. Don't do what some people do, they go like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's wrong. Go back to here. Let's do that again. One. Well, it, it can't be one because I haven't moved yet. Move one, move two, move three, move four, move five, move six. Move down one. Okay? So the answer is minus six, minus one the long number, the up and down number. You might have asked, why did I choose this particular corner? Well, because I felt like it. I could have chosen this corner, and it would move to that corner. Same thing, look. One, two, three, four, five, six, and one down. Takes me there. So all the corners move in the same way. Okay, I just choose this one because it's at the bottom, so it's easier to draw the line. Question 27. A shop sells packs of green pens, packs of red pens, and packs of green pens. It says there are two pens in each pack of black pens, five pens in each pack of red, and six pens in each pack of green pens. On Monday, the number of packs of black pens sold to the number of packs of red pens sold is in this ratio 7 to 3 to 1. And it says a total of 212 pens were sold. Now what a lot of people do is they add up these numbers, that gives us 14, and they do 212 divided by 14 and then they hit a brick wall because they didn't read the question. This is the ratio of packs, it's not the ratio of pens because these packs have different numbers of pens inside. The black packs only have two pens in. The red packs have five pens in and the green packs have six pens in. So, seven times two, because there's two pens inside, gives us 14. Three packs of red times five pens gives me 15. Four packs of green times six pens in each pack gives me six times four, 24. So this is the ratio of pens, okay? This is the ratio of packs this is the ratio of pens, because there's different numbers of pens in each pack. So this is the number I have to use. So 14 plus 15 plus 24 is 53. 212 divided by 53 is 4. It's not a bad division question as you might first think. 53 doubled is 106, and double that is 212. So 4 53s make 212. So, now we just take the number of, it asks for the number of green pens, so we take that green ratio number 24 and we multiply it by 4 to get 96 and there's my answer. Question 28 is a question about perimeter. Um, just basically just the thing that makes this tricky is actually reading what we've got here and making sense on it. So QR is 10, so let's put that in. Always a good idea to take that information and put it in a diagram. I'm someone who just needs to see numbers in a diagram to make it make sense. So QR is 10. It also tells me that BC is PQ. So what I've done is I've highlighted those two sides so it reminds me. 
Okay, if you like, you're someone who uses highlighting pen or likes highlighting pen. Me too. Use it. Now it says the perimeter of ABCD is 26, and the area of PQRS is 45. So the only thing we know first of all is that is 10, but we know also that that is 45. So this must be 4.5. Why? Because to find the rectangle, the area of a rectangle, it's 4.5 times 10, which is 45. So if that's 45 and that's 10, this must be 4.5 to make 4.5 times 10 into 45. Okay. So this is 4.5, so obviously that is 4.5, and now we're making some headway, because if that's 4.5, this side must also be 4.5. Okay, how's that going to help us? Well, if that's 4.5, so must that be, and that adds up to make 9. The whole perimeter is 26. These two sides add up to make 9, so therefore these two sides have to add up to make 17. Why? because the whole perimeter is 26 and 17 for these two sides add to the 9 for these two sides makes 26 so the two sides must make 17 and so one of them must be half of 17 which is 8.5 and there's your answer now you could make some progress you can get some marks by just doing some of this what makes it tricky is the numbers and the words I really recommend you write on the diagram. It really helps me. Question 29 is a tricky question. It looks more complicated than it actually is. Now, a lot of people guessed, and well done for guessing, because this is the point. When you're doing an exam, get in the habit of guessing, making a sensible guess, not just kind of coming to any random idea. But it says write down the coordinates of the turning point of the graph. So some people went here, and you know what? They never done it before, and they got the right answer. The turning point. Why did they choose that? Because it's turning. It's sloping down. It flattens off, and then it turns around and starts going up again. So if you had to look at this graph and say where's the turning point, you should have said there. What's the coordinate? One minus four. And if they did that and they guessed, well, 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 they've got the right answer. Then it says use the graph to find the roots of the equation x squared minus 2x minus 3 equals 0. So this is the graph of x squared minus 2x minus 3 equals 0, 2, 3, rather. Start again. This is the graph of x squared minus 2x minus 3. Where does it equal 0? Well, here's the 0 line. It equals 0 there, and it equals 0 there. So even though this looks complicated, it's just a simple matter of saying what that answer is, 3, and what this answer is, minus 1. And you get one mark for each one. Okay, that comes to the end of this particular paper. I hope you found the video helpful. Remember, it's really important to focus on understanding. That's why I've tried my best to try and explain things to you. Please, 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 I know I keep on saying it, but it's really important. Don't just copy down. It is so pointless. Okay? read the question, look at the answer, watch the video without writing, and then you have a go, and you will remember it far more. Okay? Cheers, folks. Thanks. Bye.